open your Bibles to Zechariah, Zechariah chapter 14, and I'm entitling this, Death by Radiation. Death by Radiation, this is scary. Uh, it's the kind of book you read and you just thank God you're not going to be here for what's coming on the earth. Uh, it's a way of saying, thank you, Lord, thank you, Lord. It's hard to, it's hard to believe uh, such a wrath will be coming from heaven upon the uh, people of the world, the people of the nations. You say, why is it hard to believe, Brother Militello? Because we don't understand God's holiness and his hatred of sin. It is so much more intense than you and I can ever imagine that the wrath that's going to be poured out on this Christ-rejecting world is appropriate. It's appropriate. It's not overdone. It's appropriate, and it will come. And the book of Zechariah gives us a peek into how bad it'll be. Uh, in chapter 14, Zechariah 14, I'd like you to turn to verse 12, please. And this shall be the plague, all right, plague, wherewith the Lord will smite all the people that have fought against Jerusalem. Watch that word plague. Uh, the Lord doesn't send <laughs> plagues for no reason. Now, the world's had a little taste with the COVID crisis this past year, and uh, the world has really been thrown upside down with countries having to initiate sanctions and rules and regulations on how to keep their populations healthy. And uh, they've just got a little taste of what's coming. They, it's like taking a peek behind the curtain before the curtain goes up, and it will go up soon. It, it's just waiting for the church to leave. It will go up. And, and going uh, around the curtain, taking a little peek, and then closing the curtain right away and saying, oh my God, I, I can't believe what I saw. I can't believe what I saw, oh God. How could a God of love let this happen? See, this is the thing that uh, has made us blind in a way in these last days. God loves you, God loves you, God is love, God is love, God is love. So when it comes to grasping certain things that are, that are written in the scripture, it's hard for us. It's like, wow. And look what happens. He says this plague. He's going to smite all the people that have fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh shall consume away while they stand upon their feet. And their eyes shall consume away in their holes, and their tongue shall consume away in their mouth. Well, this is a le this is instant leprosy. This has got to be nuclear radiation of some kind. Uh, it, this is something like it, it, it's going to attack certain parts of the body if it doesn't kill them. It's like a neutron bomb. The neutron bomb is not going to lay you low with death right away. It's going to just destroy your insides. But this is, I can't, I really don't understand. This is some sort of radiation, some sort of plague. And it shall come to pass in that day that a great tumult from the Lord shall be among them. And they shall lay hold every one on the hand of his neighbor, and his hand shall rise up against the hand of his neighbor. So the Lord is, all these nations that are going to come against Jerusalem in an attempt to destroy the remnant of Jews that's there, uh, the Lord's going to smite them with, a, with craziness. They're going to go insane. They're going to attack one another. Great tumult from the Lord shall be among them. They shall lay hold every one on the hand of his neighbor, and his hand shall rise up against the hand of his neighbor. It's almost like an LSD trip. You, you go into a world of demons and confusion. You see enemies where there aren't enemies. You lose your mind. It's madness. It's madness. And uh, what does it say in verse 14? And Judah also shall fight at Jerusalem. And the wealth of all the heathen round about shall he gather together, gold and silver and apparel in great abundance. Well, when these nations fall, when these people fall victim to God's wrath and die by radiation or whatever, somehow the Jews are going to be preserved. And they're going to go out and they're going to <laughs> they're going to take they're going to take the wealth of all the heathen round about them, shall be gathered together, gold and silver and apparel in great abundance. All these riches uh, that the people brought with them or the nations brought with them, maybe all the gold from the tombs of Egypt or whatever, whoever came against Jerusalem is going to lose everything and their shirt included. And Now remember, 
this this disaster comes uh, like in the Sodom and Gomorrah when the angels came to rescue Lot and uh, his daughters. Unfortunately, the wife didn't take heed. Uh, they had to strike the people that were banging on the door trying to get in with blindness. Now it says the day that Lot left with his daughters and his wife, she turned back and you know what happened to her. But it, it says that the, the, it was a disaster. Fire and he, brimstone came down from heaven and destroyed the cities of the plain, Sodom and Gomorrah. So there was a nuclear exchange, I believe, that typifies a nuclear exchange that's going to happen here. Although this is not uh, an atom bomb going off, this is what's called the neutron bomb. You've got to look it up. It doesn't kill people. It doesn't destroy buildings. It destroys you. It destroys your inward parts. They just consume away. It's unimaginable. And it says in verse 15, so shall be the plague of the horse and so shall the animals and of the mule and of the camel and of the ass and of all the beasts that shall be in these tents. So as this plague. Now I'm struck here by the animals that are attached to the people getting wiped out by radiation. Why all the animals? Now, I've got something here, uh, speculation on my part. There might be a tremendous gas shortage uh, at the end of the tribulation period. There might be, a, because it said in Revelation, don't harm the oil or the, or the wine. There's, there's something about gas-powered motor vehicles or even electric-powered motor vehicles uh, that's not going to be a factor here in Armageddon. Because you're looking at all these animals. The animals are beasts of burden, carry supplies, and they get people from one place to another. The horse, the mule, the camel, and the ass, and of all the beasts that shall be in these tents as this plague. So Jerusalem's going to be surrounded with heathen armies, uh, hating the Jews, wanting to destroy every one of them, but not having gas-powered vehicles or even electric-powered vehicles, uh, but a big, using animals for their supplies and everything. You know, you got to... The thing about the Bible is you have to put yourself, project yourself forward, and don't get locked into the world today as you and I know it. There are going to be tremendous changes that are going to occur. A lot of people don't give this thought. Once the church is removed... Uh, there's going to be uh, lots of things that are going to change dramatically uh, on this earth. Uh, not only uh, politics, but uh, commerce and buying and selling and digital currency. Uh, we can't even imagine what it's going to be like. And I got a feeling this, uh, these climate control people that are so worried about the earth warming are going to get their way, and they're going to bring in changes that are going to cause the governments of the world to reduce emissions to the point where something's going to happen with gas-powered vehicles. And unless you've got an electric vehicle uh, and EMPs, have you ever heard of the electromagnetic pulse? We could go through a situation where we can lose our power and everything will shut down. And as I'm saying this, I've read stories in the news lately about supposedly Russian hackers uh, shutting down businesses and uh, computer systems, uh, sophisticated systems that multinational corporations have. The uh, Russian hackers, uh, well, uh, allegedly, have been able to get into these systems and shut down and demand ransom. In other words, before I turn on your system, I want you to fork over $40 million, and they're successful. People, these corporations, are wealthy, are paying money to get back online. So if they can hack in, you know this thing about privacy. I learned in city government uh, years ago, if you believe these government promises or these corporation promises that this is all private and your information is going to stay private, you need a lobotomy, okay? You, you remember me saying that word. Forget it. It's not so. Everything is going to be out there as needed to destroy someone or whatever purpose evil wants to accomplish. Privacy, my foot. So uh, what's happening now in our society with being hacked, we have to develop more, more sophisticated computer systems. And man and his devices are going to go down, and the Lord's going to allow it. It's going to go down. We see it happening already. 
We see it happening already. Now, in my opinion, the principal mover of a change coming in this world will be the airline industry. Now, why do I say that? Because people love to travel. People want to go back and forth. That's the big thing of the last hundred ages since the airplane. Going back and forth here, there, and everywhere makes the, the community of nations, it interlocks them in what's called globalism. And the desire to be able to freely go back and forth to other nations is powerful. And the only way to make that thing work, I think, is going to insist at some point the airline's going to be behind this. They're going to push the governments to do this, that everyone carries some sort of registration card regarding vaccinations. It's got to come. It's got to come. You're not going to be able to go on an international flight without proving that you've been vaccinated. Now, eventually it'll go to even the national flights in between cities. Uh, states will demand it before you come into my state. Uh, if the governor of Florida turns around and says, you people from the north want to come to my state, show me you're not carrying the COVID. Show me you're not carrying the COVID. Even the new licenses here in Florida have an identifying mark that you're okay. So it's already happening. It's already in the works now. It, the, the beginning of tremendous changes is taking place. That, like I said, the climate thing will be another thing. But to keep travel going, they're going to demand, and it's the airlines, because the, for the love of money is the root of all evil. And people are going to submit to it. People are going to submit to it because they do want to go and travel and see other places and conduct business. And you know what it said in Luke about they're buying and selling and eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage and knew not until the flood swept them away. In other words... When the church is gone and they, and they set up a world system, a world bank, a world everything, things are going to be okay for a while. People are going to feel safer. People are going to feel safer. Everybody will be vaccinated. They won't get on a plane knowing somebody might be carrying the disease. Everybody will have a chip or whatever. And the Antichrist, to a large degree, will be able to enforce peace. He'll bring peace onto the earth and among the family of nations. And that's, how, that's what you read in Thessalonians when Paul said, when they, who the unsaved people, not the church, the church is in heaven, when they shall say peace and safety, then cometh sudden destruction. It's like the Lord saying, okay, you, you look around, everything seem okay, you're happy, you're satisfied, now watch, bang. And you say, the Lord does that? Sure, you look in history, he's done it. Every time man rises feeling good about himself, how about the night on the Titanic before it sank? A very happy occasion. They were going to pull in port safely the next day. How about the feast, Belshazzar's feast in the book of Daniel, when they were drinking out of those cups and things that were stolen from the temple in Jerusalem, and out comes the handwriting on the wall. Out comes this hand, basically saying, you're finished, while they were feasting. The Lord has a way of waiting till you reach a high point. I'm talking about the unsaved now. You Christians don't get nervous. But when the world just feels like, wow, things are really going in the right direction, because that's what they want to believe, and God will give them over to a strong delusion. They've always wanted to believe that. We're going to have peace on earth and all of that stuff, baloney. So he's going to give them over to a delusion, and then suddenly it's going to blow up. It's going to blow up in their face. And one of the things we know is going to happen is what we're reading right here in Zechariah about this unbelievable leprosy that people are going to contract and their eyes burning and their extremities burning. It's unimaginable. It's unimaginable. The only thing maybe comparable to a slight degree might have been the Black Plague uh, back in the 1300s in Europe when it supposedly wiped out more than half or three quarters of the European population and people were just dying left and right all over the place with black pus oozing out of sores and horrible. They couldn't even get people to pick up the dead. It was horrible. And they had cremations left and right. Oh, thank God we have not been appointed unto wrath. Now, brothers and sisters, if I didn't have a Bible, honestly, it'd be hard for me to think or, or consider where this world is going and, and the disaster that's, that's coming upon the world. It just would be maybe too much. Say, no, it, there's a God in heaven. Certainly it won't come to this, but it will. It will. And you say, why is it hard to consider that? How, how can the world consider the enormous effect that 
the son being brutalized before the eyes of a holy God, how much of an effect that had on the Trinity? How much anger has been stored up by a holy God, God the Father, in these almost 2,000 years since his, his son was butchered like a lamb? How much wrath has been stored up waiting to explode with an explosion that the human race can never... The Lord said judgment greater than Noah's flood. I mean, such as never came on the world. The world has no clue as to what's coming. And it's coming. People say Armageddon is uh, something that's written and must come. Yes, it must come. But you have no idea the intensity of it. And what I had said once after I studied Revelation and I wrote down all the figures, I said out of 7.5 billion, which there should be right now on the earth, give or take, around 7.5 billion, it appears to me that at least 5 billion, or maybe over, maybe somewhere near 5.5 billion are not going to survive. That's a wipeout. You, you consider all the wars in history, it doesn't even come close to that number. Where are they all going to be buried? What's going to happen? Cremations left and right? Brothers and sisters, it's a great thing to be saved. It's a great gift from God to have salvation and wait patiently for the Lord from heaven to come and yank us out of here. It's just a, just a hopeful thing. And I can't thank God enough, and I hope you feel the same way. Lord, thank you for saving me. Now give me the grace to wait patiently, do what I can for you while I'm waiting, and then enjoy your face when I see you in the clouds. Amen? Amen. Open your Bibles, please, to Luke's Gospel, chapter 7. I'll start with the first verse, and I'm entitling this Understanding Authority. Understanding Authority. We talk about authority. We know authority, legitimate, lawful authority, needs to be respected, feared, obeyed. And uh, we're living in a time now where you could see on the news what's happening in America. Authority is being undermined all over. And uh, what's doing it is basically political, progressive type thinking and uh, real wrong ideas of justice. And uh, it's killing, it's fracturing the social fabric of America. Uh, who wants to be a policeman or a state trooper today? You need your head examined. Even judges having things <laughs> thrown at them in court or whatever. Authority on all levels in the United States is breaking down. We could see that. And I have to admit that Donald Trump, in encouraging supporters to uh, gather at the Capitol on the January the 6th there, uh, really set a bad example, a bad example. Uh, he just couldn't handle the fact that the voters had removed him. I'm sure there was some fraud and all of that. I don't want to get into that. But it, but it was over. It was it. And uh, this the authority of the United States is represented in, in the Capitol. And you say, well, it's misused and abused. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm sure at times it is, but uh, all men are guilty of that. Uh, but it's the authority God has set up here. And uh, once you start undermining it, uh, there's a breakdown. And uh, law and order has to be restored. And in the tribulation period, we're going to have Roman law and order. It's going to be scary. It's going to be scary. You'll do as you're told or else. And believe it or not, that's going to be carried over into the, into the kingdom age with the Lord ruling what? With a rod of iron. You got that? You got, so this rebellion, this idea of I don't like who's over me, and I, it's going to carry forth even into the kingdom age of people who will go into the kingdom, believe it or not, in their natural bodies and still have resentment, not like being told what to do. Now, who understands authority best? Well, it's typified here in the scripture, and I thank God the Holy Spirit put this story in the scripture because it's what a, a soldier understands better than the average person. The soldier understands authority, and he understands duty. And if you're a Christian, you've been enlisted as a soldier for Jesus Christ, and you're in a war, and you need to understand the authority of the King James Bible over you. It's not what you feel or think or what someone else said. 
It is the word of God that has authority over you. And from the moment you're saved, the, the Holy Spirit will be impressing you with that over and over again. This is my word. This is what you need to follow. Uh, am I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Is sometimes you, you don't want to hear the truth. Uh, but here it is, starting with the first verse. Now, when he had ended all his sayings, it's uh, in, in, in the audience of the people, uh, he entered into Capernaum, one of his favorite places, the Lord, and, and a certain centurion's servant, who was dear unto him, was sick and ready to die. And when he had heard of Jesus, he sent unto him the elders of the Jews, beseeching him that he would come and heal his servant. And notice in verse 3, he doesn't go himself, he doesn't send a detachment of so soldiers. He knows he's a Jew, the Lord's a Jew. He's heard about him, obviously, and he sends the elders of the Jews, figuring that's his best bet. And when they came to Jesus, verse 4, they besought him instantly. Now, that's interesting that the Holy Spirit should put that phrase in, besought him instantly. In other words, no baloney, get right down to the point. We've got a problem, and we're here, Lord, with Jesus, we want you to handle it. That's it. That's right to the point. Saying uh, that he was worthy for whom he should do this, testifying to the Lord that this Roman centurion was a good guy for the Jews. He was good. He was worthy. He was some, the Jews have a, a, a classification called the righteous Gentile. Uh, when you go down a certain street, I think it's, is it Jerusalem? There's a boulevard, the street of the righteous Gentiles. And on every corner, there's a name of a Jew, of a, a Gentile who was uh, prominent in saving Jewish lives. And they're called righteous because in the mind of a Jew, if you save the, the life of a Jew, you're righteous before God. So you, you have, remember Oskar Schindler, Schindler's List, that German who uh, behind the back of his Nazi superiors was smuggling Jews out, trying to get them out, Schindler's List. Well, that street of the righteous Gentiles, I don't know for sure, but it might begin with the first Gentile that saves Jewish lives is a harlot woman, Rahab. How about that? She finds out the Jews there are ready to take over Jericho. She's panicking over that, and she's got Jewish spies come in, and she hides them. She saves their lives. She tells the uh, elders of Jericho, no, they, were, they went the other way. She, she's a righteous Gentile, although a harlot, you see. She was out to save her skin. She knew the Jews were unconquerable, and she wanted her family saved too. I wish more people would understand that in history. The Jews are unconquerable. They will, in the end, when the dust clears, they will have it all. And to go against them is, <laughs> it's not gonna, it's not gonna work. Oh, temporarily, the devil will have success during the tribulation period, and he'll think he's got the upper hand. Uh, then the Lord will steal his thunder and reduce him to nothing, and the Jew is unconquerable. Now, why was he worthy? Well, it explains in verse 5. For he loveth our nation, and he hath built us a synagogue. Well, in the eyes of the Jews, you are quite a Gentile. You loved our people. You cared for them. You looked out for them. You weren't oppressing them. Although you were a Roman centurion, you could have used your authority to give us a lot of grief. But you didn't, and you built for us a synagogue. You ingratiated yourself with us. You've got, a, you've got a testimony here. And uh, then it says in verse 6, Jesus went with them. See, when he heard verse 5, he didn't hesitate. He went with them. Amen. He went with them. And when he was now not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him. The centurion didn't even come out. He sent friends. He sent bodyguards, whatever, to him, saying unto him, Lord, trouble not thyself. Lord, how did you know he was the Lord? Why are you calling him Lord? You heard about him, obviously. Maybe you even heard him preach. You're in Capernaum, so maybe you saw a miracle. Who knows? Something led you to say, Lord, Lord, trouble not thyself. <laughs> in other words, I know who you are. Don't even bother. I'm a Gentile. Uh, I know you don't even have to come to my house. It's, it doesn't happen. For I am not worthy that thou shouldest uh, uh, enter 
under my roof. I am not worthy. Boy, wouldn't it be wonderful if more people said that to God and, and acknowledged that? I'm not worthy. Would you save me? I, I'm not. I, I'm very religious, but I'm a, I'm a phony. I'm a piece of garbage, and I wear my own self-righteousness as a, as a badge. I am not worthy of eternal life. Measuring myself against other people because of my uh, religion or my, self, or my righteousness or my good deeds, whatever, I kind of look worthy because I'm measure, measuring myself against others who don't look so good or don't have a good testimony or not honest people or whatever. But in measuring myself against the perfect man, the Lord Jesus Christ, I can't even say I fall far short. Far short is not the right way to describe it. <laughs> way out short. I am not worthy of eternal life. I cannot earn it. If you're going to do me a favor and save me, amen. I beseech you, save me. I am not worthy. That's how a person gets saved. You got to drop the self-righteousness and your idea of yourself and stop comparing yourself with others. Look around. You'll find a lot of other people that are worse than you. And, and if you're going to use that as a justification for holding on to your self-righteousness, well, like millions of other Americans, you're going to go to hell. You're just going to go to hell. Wherefore, he says in verse 7, neither thought I myself worthy to come unto thee. That's right. He sent his friends. He didn't leave the place. But say in a word, and my servant shall be healed. Well, that's a recognition of power. So obviously he knew about Jesus or heard him or saw something. Why would he say that? Say in a word, and my servant shall be healed. He had complete confidence in the power of Jesus over sickness and other things, perhaps even death. Uh, but there was no hesitation there. Now, he has a confession here, and I, and I say that this verse 8 in this chapter is one of the greatest statements in the New Testament, for sure. It really is. When you look at this carefully, for I also am a man set under authority. See, in the, in the verse before, he said, I'm not worthy. All you, all you need to do is say a word, just a word, and that'll do it. So he says, if I am a man, I also am a man set under authority having me soldiers, and I say unto one, go, and he goeth, and to another, come, and he cometh, and to my servant, do this, and he doeth it. In other words, I'm used to giving orders. I know who you are. You're the ultimate order giver. I recognize that. I'm, I'm not uh, confused at all. Do, do you recognize the fact that God has a pure Bible with authority? Where the word of a king is, there is power. Have you ever read that in Ecclesiastes? Do you realize there's power and authority in this book? And all the other modern versions, the NIV and all of them, come off like wimpy craps compared to this book. Do you reckon, can you discern the power and authority of the King James? You say, well, a lot of Christians can't. Yeah, well, sure they can't. Why? Why have they been blinded? Why can't they recognize the authority of the book? Because it disturbs them. It frightens them. It makes them uneasy. Uh, they, they say they love the Lord and they're saved. Amen. But they're afraid of authority. They're afraid of boldness. They're afraid of that power that comes off the pages of a King James book. Bible. They'd rather listen to somebody in a pulpit like a marshmallow. Well, it's just terrific. You're here today in church, and we're just loving everybody. And we're so happy you came, and I've got exciting things that are coming to our church, and I want you all to be in excitement and everything. Oh, come on. What the heck? I don't go to church to hear that stuff. Post it on the bulletin board, but give me a sermon that's going to cut, that comes across with power, so I know I've been dealt with when I leave the church after hearing the sermon. He says, I also am a man set under authority. In other words, Lord, you and I, we got, we got an understanding about this authority issue. When Jesus heard these things, it must have really impressed him. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him. Like, wow, look at this guy. No problem here whatsoever. And turned him about and said unto the people that followed him, must have been a crowd there, I say unto you, I have not found so great faith. No, not in Israel. 
not among my people Israel. So great faith. What faith? What do you mean faith? He had faith. Faith in what? Well, number one, he recognized the Lord. Number two, he had faith in God's power to do anything. With God, all things are possible. That's faith. He didn't clamor, I need to see a sign. I need to see a sign. The Jews were always asking for a sign. And the Lord answered them, you evil and adulterous generation that seeketh a sign. They had a lot of signs. They didn't believe any. Even one coming back from the dead wasn't going to convince them. So, what's that? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, that's just, excuse me a second. The, the, the authority issue, I learned that as an unsaved kid, <laughs> adolescent in a Jesuit school, the authority that they had through their scholarship and learning, and they dressed up like a priest, so they had that uh, everybody in awe because we thought of them as holy men, men that walked with God and all of that. It wasn't until the Lord opened up my eyes that, I was disabused of that notion. But there was such a respect for authority. There was such a respect there and a fear. Authority, uh, this is the thing. People don't, a lot of God's people don't have the faintest notion about what it means to fear God. They don't. Years ago when you were told by a cop, you know, I remember in Brooklyn to move on or whatever, you moved on. Or you might have gotten a, that uh, stick across your kneecaps or something. You moved on. You respected authority. You were brought up to honor authority. And when I went to high school with the Jesuit prep school in Brooklyn, I remember them saying, I'm going to hand out these test papers, and we're on the honor system here. And I don't have to repeat that you're all expected to be honorable young men. And I'm going to leave the room. I don't know when I'm coming back. And you do what you have to do. And I'll be. And he walked out, and everybody looked at one another. And I don't remember anybody asking to move over and let me see your answers or whatever. I don't. I don't remember any of that. And we will look unsaved Catholic kids here, and that that power they they exuded some sort of a, you know, you'll do what we want you to do. You'll do the right thing. You'll grow up with character. So this is what's missing, brothers and sisters. It's, America has deteriorated. The character, the social character fabric of our country is in tatters. And we ought not to be surprised because Paul had told us this in 2 Timothy chapter 3, in the last days perilous times shall come. Well, why are they going to be perilous, Paul? Uh, well, because there's going to be no character. People are going to, men shall be lovers of their own selves. They couldn't care less about you and they couldn't care less about authority. And that's the way it's going to be and that's scary. So when the situation changes, and it will at the rapture, and a new world order will come in and, and uh, establish itself, uh, there's going to be fear. There's going to be a, a blowback to, to what happened years ago uh, when Rome ruled with an iron fist and, uh, and the dictatorships that existed in Europe uh, before the, uh, well, before World War II started, uh, ruled populations with fear. It's going to be a return to that. There has to be. Because in, there's no other way to stop the erosion of irresponsibility and lack of respect for authority. The only way the authority will be uh, respected again and feared is going to be the mafia way. It's going to be the way that has always worked in the past by... Uh, allowing some things to happen that frees you with terror and fear. And that's how you get it. That's how you get people to go along. Uh, and who was it in the mafia that said, I'd rather be feared than loved? <laughs> feared. Uh, the Lord wants to be feared. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Why call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I say? Aren't you afraid that if you continue going your own way with your self-will, that's bad, bad things are going to happen. Doesn't that uh, cross your mind? Or do you think you get away with it? I said one time to these guys in prison when I, when I did chaplain work over in uh, Alabama, I said, you guys are all here with the same uh, problem, the same sin. You all committed the same crime. Look at me, what's that, preacher? What are you talking about? I said, you all thought you were smarter than God. That's why you wound up here. Now, some people get away with it. Eventually, if they do it enough, they'll get caught. But essentially, the bottom line was, 
You thought you were more clever than God. Somehow you were going to pull off whatever you were going to do and you were going to be okay with it. And you got caught. Now you're here. And uh, you, you got to learn this because some of you are going to leave here and you're going to be, uh, unfortunately, afflicted with the same mindset that you're cool and you could pull off something bad. And because you're cool, you're going to be okay. I'm telling you, you're not. You're not. And if you don't get right with the Lord, you really have a problem. But your problem right now is when you get out. Most And most of them were uh, ticketed to get out shortly. There, there, there weren't. Uh, long timers there and I was dealing hopefully with men that were able to understand what I was saying and warning them if you don't in here learn to develop a fear of God and a fear of authority you're going to learn the hard way I'll tell you and uh, that's it you get pulled over and you might not like it you might feel you did nothing wrong or whatever but you respect that authority and it'll go better with you I promise you Amen. Amen.